Okay? If you can hear me, raise your hand. If you can't hear me, don't raise your hand. <laughs> okay. I've got quite a bit. A chance you're you're pushing the buttons. Okay. Uh, folks, I'm really tickled to be here. I'm glad to see you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, back in June, I was asked to make a presentation to one of my stock growers about the beef checkoff because we were celebrating 50 years of the beef checkoff in Wyoming. Uh, I just want to show you a couple of things. I'm using some of the same slides. I'm going to have to talk really fast. So if you, if you have questions or anything, raise your hand to talk, ask questions. I'm glad to interact with you. But I just want to show you some of the things that are happening. Now, I want to warn you, I'm fully vaccinated. People ask me if I had any reaction. I said, yeah, I'm all swollen up. I, I don't know what happened, but anyway, that's my excuse. I'm sticking to it, so here we go. <clears throat> Chance, here we go. Uh, there are 24 checkoff programs in the country right now. Uh, beef is just one of them. Dairy has one, corn has one. Look at the list of those. Who would have thought the blueberry guys would get together and the mushrooms and the watermelon or popcorn, can you imagine? What a checkoff program is, is when people get together in the same industry and they say, let's put some money together and promote our product. Let's find out what's the problem, the problem with the consumer, what are they concerned about, how can we make things different. Now, I pay two checkoffs. I pay the beef checkoff and I pay a dairy checkoff because I am a dairy farmer as well. I want to tell you, every one of these programs are unique in how they're set up, how they're funded, who decides how to spend the money. It's really interesting. Let me give you just a little glimpse <clears throat> a snapshot at the dairy checkoff for example years ago if you wanted to buy dairy you bought a gallon of milk if you wanted to buy cheese you bought a block of cheese if you wanted grated cheese you took a cheese grater and you grated cheese right you probably know some of you probably remember that some of you probably don't have never seen that if you wanted to make a cheese sandwich you took a knife and you sliced it off and you put it on bread and you toasted your cheese sandwich right the dairy checkoff said hey Let's ask the consumer what they want. The consumer said, we want these to be, be convenient. And so they started making half gallons of milk and quarter quarts of milk and little cups of milk. And they started making grated cheese you can buy. And at first it came out and you would open it and you would have to put it in a saran wrap or something. And now they make it in a self-sealable bag. Why? Because the dairy checkoff said, we should do this. Dairy, for years, paid three people to work with McDonald's Research and Development Company to develop dairy products that McDonald's sells. How many of you have eaten some of the frappes and things they have at McDonald's? They have dairy products in them. <clears throat> and they said to McDonald's, sell milk with the, the children's meals, but make it cold. Have, it, have you guys ever drunk, have traced the milk at McDonald's? Show me your hands if you've never done that. <coughs> Is it cold? It's cold. They said, make it ice cold. That's one of the problems we have in schools. Is they take a tray of milk and set it out and it gets warm, then they give it to a kid and say, here kid, drink this nice warm milk. And the kid's going, yeah, get it away from me. <laughs> anyway, so those are some of the things that we've seen with the dairy industry. Uh, now with dairy, I pay 15 cents for every 100 pounds of milk. Milk is sold by the pound. With the beef industry, so as my cows, when I was a kid, a 50 pound cow was a great cow. I have cows today that give 145 pounds of milk, just going away. They're doing 15, 16, 17 gallons per cow. So as my cow's production has increased over time, I'm still paying 15 cents per hundred weight, but you see how my checkoff has increased with the increased production. The beef industry doesn't have that. Try the next clip here. We started, the, the beef council in Wyoming started in 71. I'm gonna let you read these numbers because I don't really care about too much about this. But eventually we came to the point, go another one. In 1985, we got a national checkoff produced in the Farm Bill and approved by the farmers. Uh, took three tries to get a referendum, and it was we pay a dollar per animal when we sell them. So if you sell a cow, it's a buck. You sell a steer, it's a buck. You sell a baby calf, it's a buck. We all pay the same. There's no provision for the increase of cattle numbers or things. And so we've seen some problems. Uh, let's go on to the next one. The dollar is collected by the state. They submit 50 cents to the national level, and the other 50 cents, the state PB council decides how to sell, or how to spend that money, and that's what we've been doing for a number of years. Let's go again. I want to show you this slide. <clears throat> this is 1980, if you can't see very far. I have my glasses in my pocket here. 
and we're clear over here to 2003. This shows the demand for beef, and it was falling like a stone. You see where this turned here? 1986. Why was it changed? It, was, it started to make a change because we started asking the consumer, what do you want? What's the problem with beef? What do you need? And, and we started addressing those concerns. You see this change here, where it changed to start back up? In that year, 97, 98 there, we said, we've got to get the entire industry together working on this. So we got cow calf producers, uh, stock operators, feeders, processors, retailers, purveyors, uh, uh, even the livestock markets. I know it's clicking, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, keep going. Uh, and they said, we've got to get everybody to figure out what's the problem in our industry. Because if we don't know what the problem is, we're just spending money trying to, hey, let's fix it, let's advertise, that'll fix it. You know what, that's not doing it. And so we, we started to address those concerns even better. And we started to make a change. Okay, go to the tents. <clears throat> now I'm gonna walk through these pretty quickly. I want to tell you, I was asked to serve on the Beef Council in 1991. Where's my friend from the University of Wyoming? <laughs> there you are, look at him back there. <laughs> He's waving in the back door. I just wave. You wave. <laughs> uh, in 1991, I went to my first state Beef Council meeting, and, and I started to understand what we were trying to do to, to promote beef. And they sent me to a national meeting. At the very first national meeting, a guy got up and he says, we are using checkoff dollars to map the bovine genome. You guys know what DNA stands for? Does anybody here know what DNA stands for? Raise your hand, quick, don't you? Yes, what does it stand for? Deoxyribonucleic acid. That's right, deoxyribonucleic acid. My friend tells me that DNA stands for the National Dyslexic Association. <laughs> if you didn't get that, you missed it. <laughs> anyway. They brought a speaker out at that, that first meeting, and he said, what we're doing, remember this is back in 91, we didn't have cell phones, you still had pay phones on the, on the corner, and he said, this is like standing at a pay phone in front of a 40-story office building and saying, calling every single office, office one on the first floor, what do you do? Office two on the next floor, what, or, what do you do? Until you know what everybody does, and then you go back and you say, office number one, who do you work with? I work with office number three on the fourth floor and the seventh floor and the fourth floor. Anyway, you know, the DNA is the, the thing that talks about this. The reason I bring that up <clears throat> is because, because we, and I say we, all the beef producers paid for that. We kept that in the public sector. When you do DNA work today, you don't have to pay for a tech fee. I plant Roundup Ready corn. Anybody in here plant Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready beets, sugar, corn, hay? Raise your hand. So there, every time you buy a bag, what do they charge you besides the seed corn price? Do you know? They, they charge a tech fee because companies like Monsanto map the, bulb, the, DNA, the DNA for the corn or the sugar beets and made the changes and they charge you a tech fee, but you know what? For the beef industry, because we pay for it, nobody has to pay for it. If you, if you punch a cow's ear, you know, and take a sample, you're gonna pay for the processing of that, but you don't have to pay a tech fee because we all paid it. Now, my University of Wyoming friend, where was he? There you are, stand up there. <laughs> this guy told me yesterday. <laughs> Tell him what you said yesterday to me. I said, I was on the other side of that. I worked for a DNA research company, we sequenced the bovine genome, and I was counting my retirement dollars because of Mr. George there, I still work in the <laughs> Because all of us paid for the company to do the research to meet his company, and we didn't patent it. I'm so sorry that you're still working though, but I appreciate your honesty to be here. Okay, so we started some of these campaigns in, in the 87, 88. Uh, how many of you remember James Garner was the voice. How many of you remember me? How many of you even remember James Garner? Some of you don't, but Sybil Shepherd. Turns out later on, Sybil turned out to be a vegetarian. Move forward. We started, we started introducing, uh, people were saying as we researched the consumer, they said, we're concerned about fat. They obviously haven't had COVID shots yet. But anyway, so we started rolling out new products, trying to stip it. Now the checkoff does not actually do work. They don't buy beef and grind it up and make lean things. What they do is they do the research. It's like striking a match and saying, aha, 
here's an idea. And somebody says, hey, that's a great idea. And then they can do it. So go to another one. We came with the whole down music in 892, the start of the Me Fits What's for Dinner campaign. So again, we started making meals, 30 meals for 30 minutes, because consumers said, we want to have a convenient product. And we said, we've got to figure out how to do this. So we came up with recipes. We had a culinary kitchen, the Chekhov had a culinary kitchen making recipes. Cattle women, these cattle women, started promoting these products. They started making recipes. They did in-store demos. Next. This one was really an interesting time. <clears throat> this is really a sad time. In 94 to 96, we started having people having problem eating hamburger. And they were getting E. coli, 015787 contamination, and we had some people die. <clears throat> I'm just out of breath, sorry, I'm not really crying. <laughs> sorry, I lean on you. <laughs> what we found, folks, we, we used checkoff dollars to bring researchers in to say, what in the world's going on? And I, they brought a guy in that I could even understand. He said, E. coli is in the, back, is in the colon of every vertebrate animal on the planet. And bacteria are in our guts, and they do good things. They're in our cattle's guts. They break down the things, the feed that we eat, and they produce, he called them sugars, okay? So he says E. coli produces two sugars, an O sugar and an H sugar, and there are 160 different variants of the O sugar that it can produce, and eight different H variants. So when I talk about you can have E. coli O1H1, E. coli O160H7, but E. coli 0157H7 was a toxic one. Bacteria started to produce that. We don't know why, but they said, we've got to figure this out. Well, critics said, oh my goodness, what's happening? Because they're eviscerating the animal and they're cutting open that bowel and spilling that bowel on the inside of that meat and they're grinding it up and feeding it to us and we're eating S-H something else, I don't know. I don't, I'm not allowed to use those words. <laughs> And they really were unhappy about it. And folks, that was not true. We were not feeding them. And, and so Chekhov said, we have got to work on this. And we hired university research students. They actually went in the packing plants because we developed a rapport working with the plants to say, what can we do? And they said, we've got to get a handle on this. And so here they're going down the carcass line. They started taking samples. Sample here, sample here, sample here, sample here. Where are we getting the coli contamination? And they found... <clears throat> in the end, because maybe this is where the contamination happened, and not anywhere else. They found that 97% of the E. coli contamination on the carcass came when they were taking the hide off. Because the cattle are laying down in the manure, and it's in the manure, and you're taking the hide off, or maybe they're riding in the truck, and the other cat defecates on them, who knows. But it was getting contaminated from that. And so we started doing research, 97% of the problem is right there. Sorry, to be the spit on you. <laughs> Since I really do like it, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so we did research on that, and they came up with some really innovative things. One of them that I was fascinated with, I sat in and listened to the meeting. They said, let's do this. We'll stun this cow. She's brain dead. Then we're going to string her up. And then we're going to spray her with a product like Nair. Do you guys remember Nair? Hair removal? Do any of you girls? I'm not going to ask you. Yeah. Any <laughs> I can tell you, you spilled some on your head already, but it's sad. Sorry, don't, don't get offended. Hey, say, oh, shit. <laughs> when I was in high school, you guys, uh, <clears throat> one of the young men brought some there and put it in a, inside a kid's job strap. And when he came in and took a shower, he was really surprised. <laughs> anyway, they said, let's use this to stun the animal, string it up, spray it with this Nair compound. has two minutes. They, they timed it out, and then they sprayed with water, and all the hair would come off the hide. You know, they take the hair off the hide anyway for most of the leather work, and the hair pulls the manure, so it would come off. And then they, they, the animal's heart continues to beat for five minutes, and at the end of that five minutes, you stick them and they bleed out properly, and it worked. And we actually had a company that actually built a, a facility to try this, and it was working. And then somebody said, hey, we packed it that. You can't do that, it's ours. And instead of saying this would help the industry, no, nope, we had to shut it down. So we came up with other interventions. Your checkoff, our checkoff dollars, helped them develop citric acid 
rinses like orange juice or grapefruit. It's, it's an acid. You drink orange juice, don't you? You look like you do. <laughs> if you don't, you should. But it's an acid, and they, so they, they could spray the carpets with that. And they have incorporated that in most of the slaughter facilities now, where they use a citric acid rinse to actually decontaminate. And they also figured out what they needed to do to make sure that they took the hide off, they weren't sprinkling stuff on. This was, you guys, this is groundbreaking stuff. Okay, go to the next one. Oh, this was a bad year. In 1997, Europe, the UK, <clears throat> had an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease. Do you guys remember that? And they also had people start getting variant CJD, which is a, a derivative that derived, it evolved down from mad cow disease. Now, we had a guy come in from USDA and talk about going over to Europe with this. And, and they would go in, if they got a, a sheep or a cow infected, they would kill all the animals with like a 30 mile radius. And he said the military would go in and lock you in your house with your wife and your kids. And then they go out and they kill all your cows, all your sheep, even the dogs, because the dogs are running from sheep to sheep and they burn them. That pile there, that's burning cows. It was terribly devastating. If you think the people in this country aren't afraid of hoof and mouth disease, you better think again. We are scared to death of it. And they found out that it got introduced in that country by some pork that came in illegally from China. It was in a Chinese restaurant in London. I think it was London. There was a guy that was raising pigs that was gathering up table scraps from the restaurants, taking it to the pigs and feeding it. His pig got sick, got sores in its mouth and on its tongue, and feet got sore and it couldn't walk because it affects the keratin. They, they, they'll lose the covering off their hooves or the covering off horns of the cattle. And he called his dad, he said, I got a sick pig. Doctor came, looked at his pig, didn't know what it was, went on to the neighbor, went on to the next neighbor and the next neighbor. And bang, they had hoof and mouth disease. That vet killed himself. Suicide. He, was, he, had, he had killed all his clients in their livelihood. Boy, you guys, we said we've got to do something with that. And the checkoff, are you okay? By the way, I want to tell you, I, <laughs> I had a good friend years ago that said sometimes when you're in a meeting, he says you need to close your eyes and every now and again so you can concentrate better. But just nod every now and again so you know you're listening. I know you just eat your lunch, so if you need to concentrate, just close your eyes. I've practiced this for years. The checkoff said, we've got to do something about this. And we spent some research, and, and they brought again another speaker in. They, they brought in three speakers. I could only understand two of them. The other guy, he talked so far above my head, I didn't know what he was even talking about. But this, other, this first guy said, we found out about this. Mad cow disease is called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. It doesn't mean a darn thing to me. I just like a mad cow. I've had some mad cows. <laughs> it affects them where they lose their nervous control and they start staggering. If you've ever seen a milk fever cow or a cow with grass tetany, that's what it looks like. Except if they finally fall down and die. If they get this, they die. It's a self-eliminating disease. Uh, the speaker said, and the same thing is in sheep. It's called scrapies. And he said, we found out about doing research on this because you had sheep farmers that were raising some sheep. You guys are raising sheep. You got some sheep that had scrapies. You brought it to the guy that's raising mink and said, here, mink are meat eaters. You said, here, here's this dead sheep. And he feeds it to his mink. And the mink <laughs> starts to where they get, they get mad mink disease, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> And they realize this is a real problem because it jumps from species to species. Most diseases are spe specific, yeah, species specific, but they call it a zoological or a zoological, where's the best state vet when I need her? She was here a minute ago. Zoonotic, there we go. See, I knew there were people that were smarter than I am. I've never claimed to be real smart, guys. Anyway, they said it can jump from, from species to species. It can jump to people. And it's called variant CJD. I can't even pronounce what the, what the abbreviation means for. But people can get it and it dies. And they started having it in England during the same time. Because <laughs> in England, they were eating brains. Some countries eat the eyes and the spinal column. In fact, years ago, I remember we used to cut the spine out and send it to other countries that would cut it up and eat it. 
How many of you have ever had a T-bone steak that had the marrow in the middle of the bone, remember? You remember that? You don't do that anymore. So in 1997, the industry and the government said, let's stop feeding mammal tissue to our cattle and our sheep and our animals. Because some way it's going through there. Now since then they've devised it and figured out it's all central nervous. It is the brain. The eyes are part of your central nervous system and the spine. So they take those out. Look at your next T-bone steak. They've taken that spine out. It's not there. They, they destroy it. Take it out altogether. But what happened there? Okay. So anyway, that was a major thing that we did, you guys, to try to help us. Okay, go to the next one. They, the cattle women, for all these years, were doing beef cook-offs. They did national beef cook-offs. It got televised. They were coming out with recipes. Let's keep going, because I'm going to have to talk faster. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> next. <laughs> they started doing some carcass merit studies. Now, um, I'm not going to go too far on that one. Go next one. Oh, this was interesting. I was serving on the advertising committee at the time. About 20 guys, 20 people, men and women, about half and half. And we brought a Chicago advertising firm came in and they said, we are looking for a new voice for the music, for our, for our cattle industry ads. And they brought in a bunch of names and one of them was Tom Selleck and one of them was Sam Elliott. You know Tom Selleck, big stop, good looking guy, you know? Remember Magnum P.I.? That was him. And so we listened to these voices and they said, who likes Tom Selleck? They had others too, but the men said, well, we like Tom Selleck, he's good. They said, who likes Sam Elliott? And the women said, well, he likes him. Sam Elliott. And you know, the advertising, they taught, I learned something from there, you target who you're advertising to. And the target was women, because women do most of the purchasing of the meals at home back in 2000. I don't know who buys the meals anymore, but anyway. That was the day, and the men wisely said, let's do Sam Elliott. This is Ann Whitman, who's our state beef council exec. She, she thought he was great. He was always the one saying, beef, it's what's for dinner, you remember? I can't do that very well. Either. Go ahead, step on. Ah, this one is an amazing study. I'm gonna show you pictures. The center here, right there, the rib and the loin, they call that the center of the beef has the nice steaks and roasts and stuff. It has a third of the weight of the carcass and it was bringing two thirds of the value. The chuck and the round, the front and the back of the animal, <laughs> did you like that part covered cover to cover it up? The chuck and the round had two thirds of the weight. They were only contributing a third of the value to the carcass, to the, to the value of the animal. And our charge, clear from clear back in 91, was how do you bring value to the chuck and the round? The reason is they chucked in the round, we were getting beef bone, thrown in the grinder, made it the hamburger, we were selling 70% of our beef as hamburger. <clears throat> so we said, we've got to look at this. And they said, let's actually take carcasses and, and dissect them. And so we had three universities, their meat labs groups, cut this up and do this. Now I was, <laughs> so they went through the carcass and they took every single muscle apart every muscle in the, the beef carcass and they did it multiple times to make sure they verified the data and then they tested it for sheer strength how tough is this meat how tender is it and they cooked it different ways they fried it they broiled it they grilled it they basted it i don't know i'm not a cook i don't know how to do it all but they tested them all and then they rated all every muscle and they came in and that, so i went to nebraska to talk to the cattlemen one time and i'm just after this happened and I'm standing there with a guy, a guy who walks up and he's wearing a red shirt with a big N on it, you know, from Nebraska. It says meat scientist. And I said, hey, have you heard about this, this study we're doing about the carcass? And this guy starts jumping up and down. He's like, we did that, we did that, we did that. This is the greatest thing. I thought, calm down, buddy. They haven't even got the happy hour yet. <laughs> he says, this is the best thing we've ever done. And he said, so they found out that this, who knows what the most tender muscle in the carcass is. Anybody? Take a shot. Tenderloin. Tenderloin, bravo. Kathy, I knew you would know this. <laughs> so the tenderloin is inside back in here on the inside, the most tender muscle in the carcass. Second most tender muscle is up here in the front shoulder. And they had to go after it. It's this little muscle here. You have to cut it. So this guy says to me, 
from Nebraska. He says, we found out where this muscle was. And he said, I went out to the packing plant that they were working with. And they're killing like 6,000 head of day or something. And he says, I went to the manager said, come with me. We went down. He said, I took my knife. I cut this carcass open. <clears throat> I'm out of breath. <laughs> Probably having a heart attack. Anyway, he pulls this meat out. And it's an eight ounce steak. And he says, you have a grill. The guy says, sure. So he took it and they cooked it on the grill. And he said that I put it on a plate, handed it to him, gave him a fork. And he said, the guy cut that thing with the fork and started to eat it. And he said, the guy blanched. He says, he just blanched. And he said, we've been throwing that in the grinder, the hamburger. Anyway, this, so this is the meat scientist guy telling me this. And then he said, I want to tell you something else that happened, though. Now, uh, you know we export beef, right? I always envision they kill the animal. Here's a half a beef. We're sending it to Japan. Here it goes. Here's some to South Korea. You know? No. They only want certain cuts. At the time, they were only taking nine cuts. Oh, nine. Nine. <laughs> nine cuts from the carcass to Japan. He said, we have a culinary kitchen, a culinary school there in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he said, we have students from Japan and South Korea there. And he said, we, they have a traditional dish that they like, okay? He says, we identified the meat that they were using to cut. And we identified three alternative cuts from this study. And he said they had the countrymen come and we would have them prepare their traditional dish using the traditional cut and these other three cuts that we've identified and serve their countrymen and then have them rate them. He says in most cases, they like these alternatives as well as the traditional cut or better. And our exports went from nine cuts of the carcass to 19. He says, do you realize what that's done for us for export value? It's made us have more things to sell. Okay, go on. Are you, sleep, think, oh, not sleep, think. <laughs> they came up with some really creative ads, keep going, in 2003 until fall of 2003. December 23rd, 2003. I remember what happened that day. They found a dairy cow in Washington State that had mad cow disease. And, and you know what we had done, what the checkoff had done, when I say we, I'm talking about we, us. <laughs> we knew one day we were gonna have a case and they had developed a website. They had spokespeople, they had doctors and, and med medical people that could talk about it. They had industry people all online <coughs> and it was called a dark website. And they called in and said, we've got this cow, USDA called, we got a cow confirmed variant CG, or, or mad cow disease. She didn't even go to the food chain. She was discovered at the farm. She wasn't even getting killed. And boy, we turned on the website, and then this, this turned on a huge storm. People said, oh no, we've got mad cow disease in the United States. Turn the next slide. I want to show you. This is US meat and poultry exports. The red line is beef. This is 2003, well this is 2003, this is 2004. Do you see what happened to us? Our exports were slammed, they just shut the door, bang, nobody. It took us 10 years, because in 2013, I remember they said we finally got back to either the same volume or the same dollar amount we lost in our industry because of that. It was astounding that we had lost that. But because we had that website ready, the news media got their answers. They had doctors and, and industry people talk and said, you know what, in 1997, we figured out what was happening. We stopped feeding mammal tissue to cattle and sheep and in, in feed like that. And it just became a non-story in the United States. It didn't happen in the, in the world, but it did in the United States. People kept eating beef. And it was good because all of, all of this that had been being exported suddenly went on the domestic shelf and somebody had to eat it. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> Remember that research project about the different muscle cuts? They handed that information. They took, they made cutting instructions on how to cut these things up, which pieces to take, and they handed it to the new products committee. And I went into one of their committee meetings and they, they were fun because they had sampling. <laughs> they, had, they would have food there and say, look at this. And this one guy held up a thing that looked like a 
piece of fish. It was, it was like a, you know, it was like, shaped like a fish, and it was ugly. It had all these seams of fat in it. And he said, we will never sell this at retail. But he said, let me show you how we cook it. And he cooked it. He, they cooked it, and it was prepared. And it, and it turned out the most delicious roast. You cut that, and it just fell apart. It was so tasty. And they, the new product committee says, he says, food service is going to love this product. Food service is going to love the flat iron. They came up with some other ones and started, and then they started getting these out. And then suddenly that, that whole chuck and the round that were going into ground up suddenly became <clears throat> more valuable. And it raised the value of the carcass. And it helped all of us. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, it, uh, we've done advertising. People were always saying, we've debated forever, what, what does the consumer want? Some of them want nutrition. Some of them are concerned about convenience. Some of them are concerned about uh, um, flavor and taste. It just depends on what we want. We did some nutrition advertising. We've done it, tried it time and again. Next. Uh, here are these new rollouts. The, because they were taking them out of these cattle. This uh, flat iron, you can't hardly find a flat iron in the grocery store because the restaurants buy them. TGI Fridays. Sells those. It's a feature item on their menu. And they've come up with new, and this has continued to bring results to us today. Our product is being used, bringing more value. Okay, next. Ah, oh, this one. I want to tell you about this one. Sustainability. Anybody need to close their eyes yet? <laughs> um, I was on the operating committee in 2010. When we have, now we get a book. We get a book about this big. I mean a big book with all the proposed projects for the year, and we have to read through all that, look at all the projects, and then look at the money we had, and how much it was gonna cost for each project, and decide what to spend it on. And it's a tough deal. And that operating committee is made up of 20 people. You have to have two-thirds majority, or they won't fund it. Two-thirds. And so one of the guys, one of the companies who presented the deal said, we need to do a sustainability study, because the environmental groups had got up and said, hey, we've got to be more sustainable. And they wrote in Walmarts and McDonald's and some of the big stores and big groups. And, they, and they, they've actually put the visions in their companies about sustainability. And the environmental groups were saying, beef is horrible. Oh my goodness, those cows are grazing on this land and they're using so much water, so much natural resources. They're just destroying, and they pass gas. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard, did you hear what one burp said to the other? Let's be stinkers and sneak out the back way. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> one of my poor jokes. <laughs> that joke stinks, quite honestly. Anyway, so they presented this and it didn't get passed. And halfway through the meeting, a good friend of mine from Oklahoma said, You guys, I gotta tell you, please let's revisit this. We have got to have some data to prove where we are. Because if we don't, all we're getting is what these people are dreaming up and throwing at us. And they voted again and it failed. And at the end of the meeting, we were down to final decisions. And this man one more time says, you guys, we have to have some data. If we don't have it, no one else is going to do it. We need to do a life cycle assessment. It was a million dollar bill to try to do this study. And it passed by one vote. I was there when they rolled out the results. You guys, I am so proud of you and, and us of what we do. Take, show the next picture. <clears throat> this is only goes from 2020. I took this offline. The red line is our cattle numbers in this country, okay? We were up to about 130 million there back in about 75. And our cattle numbers have come down. Do you see this? And then they started to climb a little bit here. And so we're about 95 million cattle in the country now. Look at the pounds of beef. The blue line is pounds of beef we're producing with these cattle. And see up to here, it was just very consistent. And then we started making changes. And we're producing more pounds of beef per animal in this country. Is that a success story? Yeah. If it, it, it should be, we're doing more with less. We don't need to have 130 million cattle to produce the amount of beef we need it. We're doing it with about 95 million. That is a success story. And the results from that life cycle assessment were phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to go to Wyoming Stock Growers, they occasionally have some speakers come in and address this issue. It's amazing, folks, what we're doing. And why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Better genetics. We're doing crossbreeding. 
we're doing better nutrition, better management. <clears throat> Our cattle are getting getting to harvest faster than ever before. It is a tremendous success story. And then you add on here about what we're feeding these cattle. You know, I don't know about you guys, but in our, in our dairy operation, we're feeding uh, wheat mids from a bakery out of Montana. We're feeding beet pulp from a, uh, from a sugar plant. We're feeding molasses from the sugar factory. We're feeding uh, canola. We're feeding dried distillers grains that came from the ethanol plants. Uh, I saw a dairy that was feeding carrot tops and reject carrots. In California, they're feeding them uh, cauliflower and broccoli and almond hulls and walnut hulls for fiber. The, the outside of them, those darn nuts, because it's fiber. In Idaho, they're feeding them, take a guess, potatoes, yeah. And in, in, in the, down in the south, they're feeding them citrus pulp. Guess what they're feeding them in Hawaii? Pineapple, right, that they shred. We buy the nice little side, they shred that off, they feed it to cattle, because cattle can upcycle these things. They're plant-based and they can utilize it. I went to a place in Utah, Colorado, dairy, and he had this bin full of, oh, it was meal, it smelled so good. You know, everybody always smells it. Yeah, you smell hope. I said, what is this? It smells so good. I just want to eat it. And he said, those are reject cookies from Keebler Cookie Company. He says, I find my milkers out here. They're out here eating. And, and they had reject Jolly Rancher candy in them because cattle can utilize that stuff. It's, now, some people would say, well, you're feeding them garbage. You know what, folks? We're feeding them the feed that they can utilize. If we didn't feed that to them, that stuff would all end up in a landfill. And guess what it produces in the landfill when it starts degrading? Gas, methane, hey! <laughs> anyway, the very thing we're trying to do. Okay, keep going. This is, I, my, now, NCBA had a meeting two weeks ago. My brother was down there, one of my friends, and he took this picture, and this is where we are today. He took it with his phone, and so it's not real great, but it's the same one we were showing before. You guys, we have the greatest success story of sustainability in the nation. Next one. Uh, we've done some studies on, we found out that if you eat the optimal lean diet and include lean beef, you have a better, lower cholesterol level than even just the, the main diet without the beef. Next. Oh, I, I gotta tell you something else <clears throat> about these research projects. We sign documents to say when we do research, whatever the results are, that's what we get. We're standing with them. If they come out and say beef is terrible, we're putting it out. That's because we're doing the research. But we say to the world, here, here's our project. This is what we wanted to explore. This is how we did it. This is our methodology. These are the results. These are our conclusions. Look at it, it's called peer review. A lot of companies don't want you to do peer review because if you do peer review, they may find out your research is really hokey. There was one, a gal in the UK came out with a study that said that women who are pregnant and eat red meat predispose their male offspring to prostate cancer. And that was a result, and it made the newspapers, it was going out, yay! And, and so we, we hired someone to do peer review. This woman went to find men that were 50 to 60 years old and maybe 70 that got prostate cancer. They went to their mothers. Now, how old does that make your mother? 80 to 90 years old. And they said, hey, man, when you were carrying little Johnny in vitro in your uterus, did you eat red meat? Yes, I did. Oh, my goodness, it proves it. My goodness, what did you eat last week? Do you remember? <laughs> They were asking 50 and 60 and 70 years. That, that is a total bunk. You see what I'm saying? That's why peer review is so important. Okay, go on again. Uh, I'm gonna keep going. We've started to become doing other things. We've hosted tours. These are, these are some people down in Southern Wyoming here. They're good friends. Uh, and I can't remember their names. It's a secret. <laughs> anyway, they've hosted tours. We've been going more online. Keep going, here we go. And remember the great American eclipse in 2017 when the eclipse came across? Wyoming Beef Council got out and started having burgers where people could go and have these things. Keep going. American Heart Association has certified that more than 20 beef and swaps for dinner recipes are heart healthy. We're trying to debunk that problem. <clears throat> Keep going. Oh, oh, and you know what? Go back to that one if you can. Thank, thank you, Chance, for moving this slide. This thing right here about the YouTube. We lost our ability to cook. We lost our home ec classes years ago. People don't know how to cook. 
And so now when they want to know how to cook, where do they go? YouTube. Or they go to some of our websites, and we, we've started doing YouTubes with checkoff dollars. You have to go where your consumer is. You have to touch them. Uh, let's keep going. And go yet. You heard about the Hunger Initiative yesterday. The Beef Council in Wyoming has helped fund that beef checkoff. Okay. Now, go to the next one now. Let's go beyond that. I want to show you this slide, and then I'm going to change topics all together. This shows the value of the dollar from 1960 to January of 2020. We've lost 90% of the value. In 1985, this is where the value of the dollar was. Look where we are now today. We're significantly less. The problem we're having, you saw where the count numbers went. Where did they go? Up or down? Down. That means we're collecting less checkoff dollars. And a lot of producers are hanging onto their cattle and they're not turning them over as often. I mean, if I sold my cat to you and then you sold it to him to the feed yard and he sold it to the packer, we could collect $3. But if I just, if I put it in, my, in your feed yard and I hold it and we sell it there, we're collecting $1, you see? So we're, we're having less and less money all the time for checkoff programs. You guys, the day's coming pretty soon uh, when we're gonna have to decide if the checkoff program is worth it to us. Because if it is, we're gonna have to fund it. And if it's not, and it'll be a referendum for producers, we're going to reach the point where we don't have enough value in the money we've got to even do anything. We may as well just kiss it goodbye. Now, the Cattlemen's Beef Board has to do a research. They have to do a report, and they report ROI, return on investment. The last one they did was in 2019, because 2020 has been COVID mess. That it did, who knows what's going on there? They said the return for every dollar that we're spending on checkoff is giving us $11.92 was the last figure I saw. Now, I would love to have my bank account. I'd like to put a dollar in and have them give me back $11.92 in a year. I mean, that's, I am a big proponent of checkoff programs. I think they've done marvelous for us. They have saved us from disasters. They have helped us in many, many ways. I may be alone. I may be the only one in the room that thinks that, but I gotta tell you, I believe that. Okay, I wanna change topics. I want to talk to you for a minute. We're still going. <laughs> I want to talk to you. I'm, I'm serving right now on the Meat Export Federation. We just had a banner year, a record year for beef exports. In spite of COVID, we have sold more beef this year out of country than ever before. Look at this. The value per head for the export stuff is $480 Per animal. So if you're in a feed yard business, $480, the value that you sell that calf for, has gone from your exports. Now, I'll tell you, exports, you know, we talk about exports and we think, oh man, they've taken the carcass. They take some of the primal cuts, a lot of them prime cuts, prime steaks, because some restaurants want those around the world. And we also sell other things like, we take cheap meat out of the cows and they make sausage out of it. We sell the tongue. Japan loves beef tongue. We sell the intestines and the uh, uh, omasum to a lot of other countries that eat it for tripe. Uh, they call it variety meats. We have some countries that want hearts, some want livers, and some want the kidneys. They even, even boil, they smell like urine. People, are, people want them. You know, in the swine industry, if you ever go on YouTube and watch some slaughter pigs, they get that pig up and it's dead, and then the machine comes down and goes, and takes, takes the bunghole out because they sell those in Korea. They cook it up and it looks like a big donut. It is a delicacy. They love it. <coughs> now, now, see, I'm glad we've already had lunch, right? <laughs> I went to one of the trade shows and there was this squiggly mass. And I said, what is this? The guy. And here they had pig feet and they had pig's heads and ears. And I said, what's this squiggly mass? He says, this is sow's uterus. And I said, do people eat that? And he said, you bet. He looked around the room and he said, everyone but the North Americans. He says, they slice it real thin, they put it on a skewer, they dip it in some warm soy sauce, and then they eat it. And I said, that must be good soy sauce. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. Folks, there are people that want this food and they want it back. Look at the pork, oh, and I gotta show you this one. 15% of our total beef supply in this country is being exported right now. 15%. Look at the pork. 
The pork value per head, exports are bringing them 60 bucks. They're down a little bit. But the 27, almost 30% of the pork and produce in this country is being exported. I want to talk to you about some of the things that are happening about the global supply. I've got just 10 minutes left. Go for it here. I want to talk about China. 2018, let me tell you a little background of China. China loves pork. They like pork fried rice. They like pork. They like pork. And years ago, they said, we are going to become pork self-sufficient. And they said, hey, raise pork, raise pork, raise pork. And people put pigs in their backyard and they're feeding the table scraps. And China produces 40% of the world's pork, 40%. They don't have the grain for it. So what do they do? They buy the grain. They buy corn. They buy soybean. And they take it over there. And they, so they're producing. In 2018, they got a case of African swine fever. Highly contagious, lethal. 60% of the pigs that get it will die. And they lost 60% of their herd just almost within a year. And they started importing. And suddenly, they're short of protein. China has done some amazing things right now. They are the number one exporter of nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. And they shut down the ports. They're not shipping it. What's happened to your fertilizer cost, boys? It's double. It's more than double. And that's going to have some ramifications. I'm trying to get you to look at a bigger picture here. Because the, in the Midwest, where they can grow soybeans or corn, they're going to say, I have to use more fertilizer for corn. And the soybean prices are pretty good. Maybe this year I'll grow soybeans. What does that do to the corn supply? Lowers the price. So if you have lower su supply, what does it do to the price? Uh, yeah. So we're going to get caught in a bind here. So this is happening. But China has discovered the importation of beef. But I want to keep finishing up about African swine fever. This happened the year before we get COVID. They started importing pork from around the world. Germany is a big exporter of pork. Flip forward. Oh, is that time? <laughs> Germany found a wild pig in Germany. You know what happened to their exports? Nobody will take pork from Germany. And now they've got over 2,000 cases. Look at Poland next door to it. Those are cases of African swine fever. Go to the next picture. They found a case now several months ago in the Dominican Republic. And the Dominicans said, hey, the Haitians down here have been buying our pigs because all theirs died for about a year. You know what it was? <laughs> what was it? African swine fever. It's jumped the ocean, folks, to the Dominican Republic. But why am I concerned about this? Why should you be concerned? Because they are 700 miles from the tip of Florida. Who's been coming across the border down by Texas? We've had a lot of immigrants. And this is the really big one right here. It's only 80 miles from the Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is part of the United States. If Puerto Rico gets <clears throat> African swine fever, the world may very well say, U.S. pork, shut the door. And about 30% 27% of their production is going to suddenly go on our store shelves. Uh, I'm sitting in this export meeting, and there, the, the pork industry, this is their mad cow scenario. They're scared to death about it. Because if we ever get wild pigs in this country to get African swine fever, we won't be exporting any more pork. It'll break them. But it'll hurt us because suddenly all that pork is going to be like 50 cents a pound in the store compared to our 12 or $13 beef. You know, there's, that's a lot of competition. Are you okay? <laughs> You're just sitting there. <laughs> okay, go on. Brazil. Now, there, I used to go to a meetings where we have a meeting representative from the United States, Canada, Mexico, Australia, and New Zealand. Because we were the major beef exporters in the world. Brazil has joined that group. Used to be Argentina was part of that group as well. Argentina had a really interesting thing. You know, a number of years ago, their economist, or the USMEF's economist was telling me about it. She said their government, when they said, price of beef in the store is too high. I know what let's do. Let's shut the door to exports. And all that beef will go on the store shelf. And it did. And it took the profitability out of the Australian cattle producers. And they plowed the ground up and made corn. They grew other crops. Devastated them. Brazil has been going on. Brazil is still under their selling. Guess who they're selling to? 
right there. They're selling to China because China has discovered beef. They're buying beef from India. India, the Hindus, you know, that worship the cow. They don't worship the water buffalo, so they're killing the big water buffalo, which is a really poor quality product, and sending it to China. And Chinese say, wow, this beef's pretty good. And so they've been buying from Brazil, but Brazil has to, they, they can't be over 30 months old. They're still under, under duress because of uh, had cow disease, or for hoof and mouth. And so the record prices in, in Brazil are, have gone up, and so what have the guys done? They said, Let's sell all the steers and let's sell the heifers too because we're making piles of money and they're making good money. Try the next picture. Here are the Brazilian cattle prices. But you guys, if you sell all your heifers, what happens to your herd? You're going you're gonna to get a bunch of old cows and your profitability is going to go down. And so their supply of beef to go on the world market is going down. Go to the next one. Here are Brazil's exports. Look at how they've been going up, 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 up because they're selling mainly to China. Next one. Here we are. Uh, that's the one. The top line there is China. See, they've suddenly discovered beef, and they're going, "Woohoo! Let's buy beef." Go to the next one. Australia, big exporter. They have more cattle. They've got people. They export for years. They've had ten years of drought. When you have drought, you don't have grass. What do you do to your cows? You kill your cows. They have killed their cows for ten years. Their exports, their product available to export is clear down terribly. They've got plants that are, they shut them down because they don't have enough cattle to even run them. Here in our country, we're saying, please build some more plant, but we can't. And right now they've gotten rain. They're getting rain, 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 rain. And so they are rebuilding their herd. They're not selling their heifers. They have the highest priced cattle in the world right now in Australia. Go ahead. So here we are. Our beef exports are soaring. We're going to Asia. We're, uh, I'm not going to read all those you know, but Derek, turn to the next one. Why did we get them? This was because President Trump made these deals. The Japanese agreement, Korean free trade, China. China will take everything we produce. Doesn't matter if it's fed. Doesn't matter if it's old cows. They don't care if it's tripe. They don't care if it's anything. They'll take anything. And the US and the MEF, uh, the Canadian deals going back and forth, we're exporting huge amounts of pork to Mexico. They are the number one export. They love hams. And one of the exporter guys in the meeting said, if we lose that market, <laughs> I'm not making it. I've got two minutes. He said, if we lose that export market because of African swine fever, he said, in two days, we will have every reefer, every truck, every container that can hold ham full. Two days. We've got nowhere to go with it. They're concerned. Go to the next one. I think I'm about done. Am I done? Okay, no, I'm not done. And I want to just tell you one last thing here. Then. Uh, folks, cattle prices are soaring. Um, tell me, what, what were cattle prices April futures today? $1.48. $1.48. I remember when cattle, fed cattle hit $90 a pound. And the feeders were ecstatic. For the last couple of years, they've been about 20 a pound. And they've been dis discontent. Now they're at about 48. At the NCBA convention, they said, folks, demand for beef is absolutely soaring like crazy. That can't be done. There had to be more. Oh, there were more. Okay. I was going to say, I, mean, I had a couple more items I wanted to talk about. The cattle facts, who tracks cattle prices, predicts that this summer, fed cattle are going to hit about 50. And they figure that calves that we sell are going to hit about 70, about 50 to 75 a pound. We're going to see a run of wonderful deal as long as this African swine fever goes. But I want to, oh, this is, this is showing China's imports. You see how much we did up here before? A little bit. Now we're doing this. We're doing more. Why? Because Australia was doing this, and now they're doing this. Brazil was doing this, and now they're doing this. Oh, this is Brazil. I'm sorry. But anyway, go to the next one quickly. There are some real issues that are happening, and that's the problems in the ports. We had some guys from the port talk to us at the meat export meeting. It was really interesting. He said, one guy says, normally ships come in from other countries. They come right into port. They berth. They unload. They reload. They go back out to sea. Two and a half days. Turn around. He said, now, nah, I'll show that next picture. That's a picture of ships in October that are waiting offshore to unload. He says, it's gone to two months. Those ships are sitting there for two months. And the, the people that are trying to ship product in this country are so desperate. They're saying, 
load them back up with empty containers and bring them back so we can refill them and send them. And so our guys that are exporting to different places are struggling to get the product out of the country. Our freight costs for exports have gone up five times. Five times what they were pre, pre-COVID. And they can't even use air freight because they have to have refrigerated containers, you see. And they just can't, they just can't hardly get it out of the product, have to get the product out of the country. Go to the next one. Uh, those guys said there's never been stronger demand for US beef. The transportation costs and the packers, the processors and purveyors that cut things up said we're having trouble getting labor. At one point, Smithfield, that kills pigs, had so many people out that they took all the workers and put them on the slaughter line. They'd kill the pig, eviscerate them, cut the head off, split the pig in half, put it in the box, and ship it. They weren't cutting it up into hams and slices and chops, and you know they were just getting it out the door. And some of these exporters were saying to us at our meetings, they said we can't, we can't get some of the products because we have to have them cut. Now, for example, they like to take ribs. You know the, the rib meat. They'll take it and they'll cut the bone out because they don't want to ship the bone. So you have this flap of beef fingers, they call it. And they love it. But it takes labor to do that. And they said, we, the, the harvest plants can't even get people to work in the plants. They're at the over $21 an hour in harvest plants. It's scared to death. Go on. Anyway, these are some problems we're, we're having to get, work away with. Uh, I was surprised the guy from the uh, Port Authority talked about how in, I think it was Los Angeles, they take those containers off and then you put them on a rail, or a truck, they call it a rail, and they take them out and they unload them into warehouses, and then you come to get your truck and they have to get your, your container out, put it on the truck and haul it. And he said, we're having problems, we filled the warehouses. The, the trucks were full on the rails, we couldn't unload them. He says, we've activated a 67 acre lot of parcel ground and they're stacking containers on them just to get them off the ship. And then they've got in some way pre-positioned the containers that are loaded that are trying to go out. It's just a nightmare. But I didn't realize that they said that they've got a rail line clear from the California port to Salt Lake City. And they'll load, load a whole train up with containers, bring it to Salt Lake City. And you can pre-position your stuff in Salt Lake City, put it on the train, and they take it back and it'll go right back on the truck. Are you following where I'm at on this? It's just very interesting. Okay, I think, I think I'm done now, almost. We, you can see that we're exporting more beef than ever before. Go again. Exports, uh, they expect that U.S. Is, is the China of the world for food, you guys. We're going to see soaring commodity prices for everything. And I think I've done enough. So anyway, thank you for your time. I, I think sometimes we get tunnel vision and we don't look beyond. I've got to feed the cows today. I've got to milk the cows. Who's going to scrape the manure? And sometimes we need to have a bigger picture. And I hope that that's what I was able to kind of share with you today. Thank you, I appreciate it. I didn't see anybody in deep contemplation. <laughs> oh, that, that's it. Thank you all for coming. It was a great farmer's day. See you next year. And uh, if you want to join us tonight for that. Uh,